Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Having a, a woman who has defeated the kung fu ghost of Re, of Renee Marguerite, <laughs> living in a house of macaroni, previously res, previously responsible for works like Nobilis, Glitch, and the Chubo's marvelous wish granting engine, as well as contributing to Exalted and Weapons of the Gods, both games that have made plenty of play in this temple. Now coming to us with the far roofs, the one and only Jenna Moran. How are you doing tonight? Um, great. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Yep. It's thank great to be here. Thank you for coming all the way to my temple. So, a bit of a tradition with it with every newcomer is the humble beginnings, as it were, the or the villain origin story, according to some. So. Hmm. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, I was in elementary school. Um, and got the old AD&D books and fell in love at once, pretty much. Um, I mean, we were all kids. We were all terrible. I had a dungeon master once back then who thought it was actually his job to try to kill the PCs and sometimes failed. Um, you know, the kind of thing you get when you're uh, nine years old and, and playing games, but it stuck with me. Um, and never really lost the magic of it. Mm -hmm. I can, and Obviously, even with your own work and outside of it, it sounds like you had jumped around between a bunch of different systems um, over the years. When I started, um, it was kind of scattershot. I think my first really lengthy project was actually a fan game for World of Darkness uh, called Disembodied Limb. Um, where you played, uh, you know, disembodied hands, disembodied legs, etc. It was comedic, but um, it's almost a coincidence that Noblis was the one that I have to be working on when um, I fell in with a group of people who uh, included some publishers and were able to help move things forward. Because um, I've been doing project after project for many years. I think Noblis was improved by the fact that I knew that some of the, some of the people who were looking at the excerpts were um, involved in the industry, mm -hmm. but it was ultimately just uh, the one game that actually uh, had the stars aligned for it, I guess. Um, because you know it is with writing. What's, if, you, if you're a writer of any kind, you just actually physically can't stop <laughs> and um, if you're lucky if you're very lucky uh, which I was sometimes um, one of your better projects gets noticed and then things can move on from there mm -hmm. now with the far roofs this idea this huh? idea of 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 rats um, moving on this world that's hit that's hidden if you if only you look up um, yes. what would you be? What would you say were some of the media that inspired the idea? Oh, um, obviously, any talking rat story is going to have some debt to Redwall, mm -hmm. um, some debt to Reaper Cheap, even though Reaper Cheap wasn't a rat. Um, I think he was a mouse anyway. Um. I had a friend who kept pet rats and would occasionally show me videos of them. And I think that when I started on the on the rats game, it was mostly just from those things. Um, 
I've been working on this project for more than a decade, really. Um, the actual serious game development has only been a couple of years, but there have been pieces of it that have been in progress um, since early in the development of Chupo's Wish, Marvelous Wish Granting Engine. Mm -hmm. uh, so like 2015 or something. And it's hard to pick out all of the influences now because uh, a lot of it is a drunkard's walk. You know, you you go this way, you go that way, you go that way, and then something clicks, so you, so you lock that down and you move on. Mm -hmm. I originally wanted to do something on the roofs because I was working on Chubo stuff and it was very deliberately very uh, laid back slice of life stuff and I wanted to have an example of an adventurous thing that I could put nearby but being over um, you know wicked sewers and labyrinths and stuff um, really diminished the slice of life vibe of the main place uh, having something nearby that was dangerous and interesting did the same mm -hmm. um and so it was basically you know the roofs are right there they're not far away but people don't go up on them very much um for good reasons and that was just kind of like the seed crystal of it um that i could put something there the i love reaper cheap and the my friends pet rats and stuff um well that's right a lot of things came together, but there wasn't like a specific movie or book. Yeah. Was this was this a case where you ended up making a where you ended up making the idea of the world before you ended up writing any rules or what or was it or was it a case of the op, of the other way around? So when I started working on the project, I thought it was going to be a Chibos Marvelous Wish Granting Engine supplement. Um, I thought that instead of being sat at the roofs of your town, like it currently is, um, wherever your town is, um, it would be, you know, in the Chuba setting. Um, and I actually got quite far in the development of that. Mm -hmm. Um, but it never really surfaced as a project that I had the energy to like put out as a Chubo's book. Um, and then one day I was doing, you know, a week of just trying to do a game, a game a day. Um, and it was only like the third or fourth game when I fell into this rabbit hole or rat hole, whatever. Um, I came up with the basic Oracle system that the game is using the idea of drawing Scrabble letters over time and, you know, shuffling them around, pulling words out of them to be the answers to big picture questions. And I was so in love with this idea, um, both abstractly and in practice, that I wanted to put out a game with it. But um, I didn't really have a... The inspiration didn't come with the world. It didn't come with um, a plot line. It just had this one mechanic. So... I reached over my pile of drafts of stuff and pulled out the rat game and they went really well together. I mean, I had to do a lot of editing, revision, updating, you know, pull it together to one thematic hole, but um, it it works. So I guess in some ways the mechanics came first, in some ways the, the concept came first. They were two parallel uh, streams that kind of ran together, mm -hmm. get down to the sea. <laughs> I can I can get that. Now, given given that, it, was there was there a particular moment in mind where that comes to mind where you re where you realize that doing this as a supplement to Chubos was wasn't going to work. It had to kind of be its own thing, or was it a gradual affair to that point? It was actually pretty quick. It was um, it was a fast process of going through the old material to put onto the new engine. And at some point, I just realized this was really good and that I didn't want to 
Oh, it's both really good, and it was looking to be at least in setting. It's sorry, at least in system to be one of my um, most approachable games, and I didn't want to lock that into the Chibos crowd. Um, when I thought that it would be something that, if I didn't do that, uh, would have would be of interest to a wider group of people. So. Um, I don't know. I was probably like a third of the way through the hmm. revision pass to turn it into a, its own thing when it really became its own thing. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing with with that is, to, um, within this particular system, you are using dice, which was not really as much as much of a thing in Ch in Chubos. Chubos always struck me as a much more diceless, a much more narrative heavy um, affair in terms of how in terms of how the actual play worked. Though keep in mind it's been a few years yes. since since Chubos, so if I'm oh. talking out of my ass then feel free to correct me. But with the with the far roofs you're doing a, you're doing a set um, 5d6 roll and yeah do, and um, all roads lead to sets whether that whether that be pair, yes. whether that be pairs whether that be um, set sets of three or sets of three or more or, or the like um, what prompt what prompted that kind of um, 5d6 system uh, um so you're right that historically I've always done diceless games, um, and usually that's because I'll start with something diceless, and then every time I go to like add a dice roll to it, I'm like, I can't have just this one dice thing in this in the middle of this because there's a better way of doing this one particular thing dicelessly, and so it just kind of rolls forward until the whole system is that way. Um, and part of what's going on here is that I wanted a dice system for a long time just to like um, have one for projects that fit better, uh, have a general approach to go on. And I think the origin of the origin of this particular set of dice mechanics goes back to Weapons of the Gods, um, where there were... I was originally hired to do the setting stuff for the Weapons of the Gods RPG. And in the time period that I was working on that, um, two different people quit doing the system for it. Mm. Um, and I don't, I never really found out all the details of, of why in the first case. Um, but the second case um, really bugged me at the time because it was, uh, there were a couple of people who had been brought on to do the system for the game. And a lot of the uh, game had been built using their rules core. And then at some point they realized, hey, we like this, this system that we're working with. Uh, we're going to take it for our own game. And here, Weapons of the Gods is going to have this um, system we put together in an hour uh, to replace it. Uh, while we go off and do other things. Um, and I got angry about this just because um, while I've had some issues with EOS uh, Press, they came much later. Um, at the time, they'd just been, you know, nice, friendly people. They still are nice, friendly people. They, there are some issues, but they still are that. Um, and so rather than trying to adapt anything I was working on to this really dumb, really poorly statistically set out system, I wanted to sit down and figure out how to make something that A, would work with what was already there, mm -hmm. and B, was as fun to roll as possible. Um, and... Weapons of the Gods that wound up being a dice pool of d10s, and you know, you, you played, you mentioned, so you know, you'd roll three to seven, then you'd be looking for matches. Um, and the reason for that was pretty much that I picked up handfuls of d10s and rolled them, 
And of all the things I could try, that was the one that I really actually physically enjoyed the rolling process. Like, um, instead of there being this, you know, pause to do math, instead of being staring at them and figuring them out, it was just like this small dopamine hit, you know, oh, there's three ones, 31, uh, there's, you know, two sevens, 27. It, um, maybe it's just my particular brain, but it, 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 it flew, it, it, it went really smoothly as an experience. And so when I started looking for a basis for a dice system, um, I tried to avoid using D10s because people have are more likely to have D6s. I mean, they're very likely to have both at this point, but D6s are slightly more common. Um, and there had been, over the course of Up Into the Gods' life, there were stati st ah, statistical issues that came up um, that in large part were a result of many people, many cooks spoiling the, the broth, like um, mm -hmm. uh, Brad Elliott did great work, but he didn't have, he didn't build that work starting from my statistical analysis of the system. So um, uh, little things pick the, the system the System seemed flawed, and what we what was worked out when we were doing Legends of Willin later on is that the best way to fix that is by fixing the dice pool to um, they use seventy ten, I think. Um, that that we couldn't keep both the um, modifiers that we're working with and the variable size dice pool and have it be predictable enough. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, I'm talking. I'm talking forever. Um, Ultimately, I just I wanted to do a system like that. I wanted to do something with a high but not overwhelming uh, critical failure and critical success chance because that's fun too. And five d six was where it was at. And I'm I'm guessing and that's the, it. I'm guessing the emphasis on um, sets as it as it was instead of the instead of the facings of them was a way to mitigate the swinginess problem. That can ha that can happen with set based um, resolution. I really wasn't thinking in terms of set based resolution at all. Like, mm -hmm. um, I, I might have looked at it in those very early experiments of picking up handfuls of dice and rolling them, but it really all just was the fact that that looking at you know two sixes and turning that into 26 in my head was just really um, uh, positive in terms of uh, brain energy. <laughs> um, and I guess I've, I've played like weapon, I've played like World of Darkness. So I've, I've seen what can happen when you're looking for successes. Um, you know, particularly when you're rolling, you know, 20 dice or whatever. Um, Which is fair after after all um mage is a perfectly balanced game with no exploits whatsoever <laughs> um it's mostly just that um it's just a bit more cognitive load and it's it's trivial um just like you know rolling 3d6 and adding them which is um you know the pretty much the default system. Um, I think like if you look over all games, that might be like the, uh, it might be close to average. I just be the first one that I, that I really worked with um, outside of D and D, but um, yeah, that, that's not really a meaningful effort at all. You know, you, you roll a few dice, you look at them and, you know, tenth of a second later you have the number, but it's, um, it's mental effort. And, um, Minimizing that just seemed like it was um, ideal so that people could wind up just sitting there rolling dice for fun instead of um, instead of having it be a thing to mildly avoid. Yeah. Well, let, and let's be honest. Everybody's got a bit of dice goblin in them. <laughs> I think this is true. 
um, it's it's why I cared to make a dice system when dice dice has, has been my um, motif. It's just yeah, I mean, rolling dice is great. Mm-hmm. You you want to do it. You, you're you're staring at a locked door. You know, you 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 want to be able to say, oh, can I pick this? <laughs> um, and yeah. roll some dice, even if you're not somebody who actually picks locks. <laughs> so no. that's the thinking process. When it comes to the let, when it comes to the letter tiles and cards, was some was some of that descended from the um, card design that you have in Chubo? Since you mentioned this originally being um, rooted in Chubo, um, it actually all started with the letter tiles. Um, having done the letter tiles, I thought, you know, what else can we do that's sort of like this? Um, and at the time, I thought there would be drawing cards, and uh, refrigerator magnet words. Mm-hmm. Um, and I ultimately wound up mostly dropping the refrigerator tile words just because um, I never had a case where they really stood out, um, you know, where you get words from, you know, Zen refrigerator magnets or, you know, Friendly text refrigerator bags. You know, there are these sets, and they were. You know, all the players liked drawing them, but in the play tests, they never actually put them together for anything. Um, whereas letters, they were enthusiastic about, and cards. Um, I people liked drawing cards and having you know a high card around or a card of a suit that they use or a lot around. So. The Chubo's cards are very specifically things to have kind of floating around you. So you look at them and you're prompted by like this little bit in the back of your head going, oh, this is what my character is experiencing. Um, whereas the cards for the far roofs um, are much more a vehicle for doing interesting play with powers. You know, there's. Um, there's powers you can buy that need, you know, an eight plus card or a diamond or whatever. And having that language let me um, make the powers and other things in the system much smaller than when I was working with them dicelessly and had to go on for, you know, half a page each to like cover all the nuances. Um, the existence of cards let me work around. Let's me work around that a bit by just having um, a diamond sort of are associated with this kind of thing. So this power will use a diamond, and then I don't need to hint at that the rest of the time. Mm-hmm. I guess. Yeah. Now there, there's some games who build their worlds around a concept and let the table fill in the blanks of of that concept, whereas others have a def- have a defined um, setting. That the that the players inhabit, neither neither of which is better or worse than the other, but they are two different schools of thought. Right, right. Um, where on that spectrum do you see the do you see the far roofs? Um, fundamentally, the far roofs is uh, it's probably closer to the concept thing because. It's a game about um, experiencing the world. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that is, you know, experiencing the faked world, you know, the, the uh, world I dreamt up as the setting. But thematically, a lot of it is just about experiencing the world, about the act of going out there and um, being in the moment, um, being excited by or interested by something, um, being overwhelmed and confused, just like it's about that being there. And the roofs come into play here as like places that exaggerate those experiences, um, the the mysteries, the monster gods that you'll see in a bunch of the you know the videos and the site stuff are exaggerations of experiences. Um, And you can move the game 
to other settings if you want. Um, but the core that can't be changed is that uh, it's a game where you actually, um, at least subconsciously, think about what it's like to be experiencing this, um, rather than focusing on the uh, action loop mm -hmm. uh, more than anything else. Yeah, I can get that. And and given that it is built or ar built around exploring i'm get i'm guessing that you have plans on putting a variety of story seeds to kind of move things along for in that in, it, in that initial um stage for lack of a better term so what the game has currently is a built-in campaign um that was mostly um almost another stream of development entirely from the ones that I talked about earlier, because at some point I said, okay, this is really good. Um, I want to get into people's hands. And in particular, I started thinking about how on the glitch Kickstarter, a lot of people uh, left notes thanking me for including the hardship level, um, which you know is not originally my idea or anything. I got it from... Um, I got it for some other Kickstarter that was running at the time, but um, once once that once I was reminded of that, um, I really wanted to have. I, I started thinking about how um, how having people um afford the tubeless books is difficult. Like um, the PDFs are, are easy. Sometimes I've had them for as low as $5 each, but um, the full set of books that you want at the table um, because they're pretty and enjoyable and stuff um, is it's a lot of money. And um, most of that's for the printing and shipping. Um, and so I had this idea that I would try to make this into a game that would Cover the same ground as the three core Chubas books, but um, be slim enough to be affordable print on demand um, to have the entire thing at least fit under the media mail um, limit of like four pounds or whatever. Um, and ideally smaller so that so that I can make it available at even the minimum level um, as a as a pretty physical book. Um, and given that I wanted to capture the everything that was in the core three Chibos books in that volume, I had to have a campaign that would be um, comparable to the Glassmaker's Dragon. That is, you know, it would be something that you could run for years. Um, and so there are story seeds, but mostly what there is is. Um, a pre-built campaign, if you want that, um, and it really is long. It really, I could see it taking six years to play through, um, unless you're like in a college dorm and playing every night. Um, but if you're like adults with uh, constant scheduling issues, six years probably. Mm -hmm. And then there's rules for like making up your own stuff. There's um, there's step by step. Um, if fairly quick things on how to build the places, how to build the monsters, how to build uh, the rats, how to build everything. So um, I've possibly lost the thread, but I think that's that covers everything for the answer to your mm -hmm. question. Yeah, I can I can cer I can certainly get that, especially especially with some of the some of the concepts that are going to be are going to be present and. When it when it comes to the um, when it comes to the power when it comes to the power set that you have for the game, uh, was was a lot of it just do just doing was a lot of it just simplifying what you had with um, Chubo with Chubo since you mentioned you mentioned some of them being developed and refined uh, through that along with uh, along with other work. Um, yes. Um... 
basically, um, it took me it took me a number of years after Chubos to actually fully finish the power set that the game needed. Um, like there was there's there's plenty in the core book for you know all your needs in Chubos, but um, if you just look at the, how the powers are set up there in Chubos, there's there's some obvious gaps. Um, and so pretty much after putting Chubos out, I spent you know two or three years just finishing out that power set and um, and what I had was something that worked, but it was also um, in the Chubos format, which was for historical reasons very sprawling. Um, and for me, at least, it's a very generic mm -hmm. set of things. It's a set that's like, um, I don't know if it can capture how other people see fiction, but it's a very complete map of how my brain processes fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to give that bigger exposure. Um, and I also had a halfway developed campaign for the um, for the rest of the roofs floating around anyway that they use that so yeah um it, it's pretty much um it's two thirds of the final chubos power set counting all the tumblr and patreon work hmm. um boiled down to something that could fit you know in a handful of pages yeah i can i can certainly get that now with with that in mind, uh, what would you be shooting for as far as the as far as the page count for the core rulebook? So it's currently at two hundred and twenty three pages, mm -hmm. um, and that actually covers everything. Um, I cheated because I do my own layout, um, and then have I had uh, Jen Manley Lee who did the glitch layout. Um, do a first draft with like, basically just like, here's how to handle all the sections. And then I went in and um, actively edited text while doing layout on it to make it so that every section ended, you know, just in time, you know, to, to end on a page, et cetera. You know, there are compression tricks you can do when you're doing both writing and layout that you can't do otherwise. Um, it really should be like a 400 page book, but it came out at 223 and I'm probably going to add, um, Kickstarter is doing well. So I'm probably going to add a couple of, um, maybe 10 pages of extra art. Mm -hmm. Um, it mostly depends on my finding good places for it. So, um, I'm not sure exactly how much, but I've reached out to a couple artists already because things are going well. Um, but, yeah, it's about in terms of content. Um, the original draft has like two hundred eight pages of text and fifteen of art, so that's that's roughly what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. I can I can certainly get that. And with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. I appreciate it. I love temples. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often Thank say so around much. here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. That's good to know. I would have completely failed to drink. And of course, a sincere Thank thanks so goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! Thank you so much again.